Hello, and welcome to Openly Gamer Theater's Tower of the Ape. A Savage Worlds Deluxe roleplay drama from the producers of Gamer's Table. Be warned, this production may contain some explicit material that may not be suitable for all audiences. And I'm playing the luckiest. This is Dan. I'm going to be playing Matadai. This is Shannon, and I'm playing Lovaisa. Hi, this is Dave, and I'm playing Ronyos. Hello, my name is Jason. I'm playing Odored Soractus. And I'm Sean. I'm playing Mofir. Light from the brazier flickered on the bearded face of Strom Seractus as he sat at his field table. Dawn was a few hours away, and with it came the unenviable task of riding into a valley filled with mindless horror. Diabolical darkness advanced across the land, with only his force and those allies he could muster quickly standing in its way. If left unchecked, it would build strength and momentum, becoming a wave that covered the earth. He hadn't wasted breath on imploring the King of Tehran for help, for he knew it would have fallen on deaf ears. Though Yezdegerd possessed the largest and most feared fighting force in the world, he would never come to the aid of those who lawlessly lived north of his border, whom he strove to eliminate, having labeled them menace. Weariness touched Strom's eyes as he looked at the two men who shared his pavilion. Odred, his brother, ten years his junior, squatted in the peculiar flat-footed fashion of the Picts as he dozed with his arms crossed over his knees, head bowed. The other was a begrimed man called Mofir, who stared lovingly at a flat, smooth river stone, which he caressed between his hands. Several days ago, Strom showed them the valley where the mindless horde dwells. It was during that scouting mission where Strom bore witness to the extent of Mofir's power. The man was not an addle-braid charlatan, as he first mistook him for, but a true prophet. Weighing on him was the fact that no one had ventured that close to the valley without succumbing to the effects of the mind sickness that changed men into ravenous beasts. Yet they had. Could this prophet of the earth truly be the key to defeating the darkness? Strom looked up as the flap of his tent was unceremoniously thrust open and Sergus, one of his outriders, entered with a dark-haired Harkinian. The commander curtly nodded to his scout, who left without saying a word, leaving Matadai standing in the opening. The Kozak smiled at the bonded. Arms crossed. Start looking out. When we were delayed, gathering allies, I suspected that you would find us. 
With our swelled numbers, it shouldn't have been too difficult a path to follow. Aye, thank you. Though I fear what may be following me. No, I fear what's ahead. Strom looks at you, almost in surprise because he thought you were sleeping, but he's not that surprised that conversation woke you up. Our scouts have reported signs of a force to the rear, probing us. I believe I was followed. By? I believe the amassed army of what is left of Sultanapur. This could play into our favor, brother. It could. Strom, there is a company following me, I, of this I am sure. A companion of ours has apparently murdered the prince. Who among your companions could have done something so foolish? Lovaisa? Indeed. I know not why, if it's true or not, but I barely escaped with my life. There are larger forces playing in this game than just us and your army, Strom. The gathered strength of Tsultanapur and the northern Turanian army would be a formidable force indeed, even without Yama to lead them. I feel that this is all a plot. Perhaps. Regardless of whomever is scheming from the shadows, they may have given us the means to see this through. How far away are they? They can't be more than half a day's ride behind me. Understood. Half a day's march to the northeast lies a valley full of the mindless. Like the they general? Exactly like them. A valley full of thousands of people. It's insanity. It would be folly to meet them head on. I don't think we have any other choice. We don't choice. have a choice. And in order to get to the tower, we have to go right through the heart of the valley. Plunging into the center. Mofir's eyes glaze in the dancing light of the brazier. His head turns slightly, as if hearing a voice in the wind outside the pavilion. Then he blinks, eyes focusing on Odred, and then mad at I. There may be another way. Mother Earth has spoken to me. Oh. She said she will show us the way. Is this the darkness that she has been speaking of, Mofir? I believe so, yes. Strom, I suggest a faint. It would not be easily done, not with our new numbers. But your pursuers will be emotional, no doubt reckless in their rage. Let them be the spearhead. Says, yes. You forget those who get too close to the valley. They fall prey to the sickness. They become mindless. Your faith in Mofir, our faith in you, my Samoyan friend, to protect us is one thing. But there's a real possibility that the valley's horde will be bolstered by the mindless Turanians joining them. Mad at I stands while the others sit in silent contemplation. Then Strom stands, dons his folded fur hat, and straightens his thick coat. Let us discuss this with those who have rallied to my call. Captains of four free companies have joined with us this night. We need to see who among them are men. He nods to Mad at I as he moves past him into the frigid air of the nighted step. The others follow him as he approaches a low burning campfire where stout men are gathered, awaiting Strom to update them. Strom looks to the gathered men in turn. Each one of these captains is the leader of his own free company, and they've rallied under Strom because of the darkness that is approaching, and they realize the threat that's coming to them. As Strom approaches, they begin discussing the fact that some are saying that this mission of Strom's, this going up against these mindless creatures is folly. There's no way to win. You know, some, some start barking about the, the mind sickness. How can we even go into that valley? You know that those that venture within a league of it have thrown down their arms and joined the horde. I have bled with each one of you for mutual causes and for favor. In light of that, any obligation that you or your men have to me, I consider them paid. I will not force any man to undertake this task. Anyone who wishes to walk away with his company may do so with a clean conscience. In true fashion, people just start yelling at each other. And Strom just stands there and just kind of lets it go. And to the point where they start to simmer down. All right, I'll look at Mo Fear. Do you want to tell us about the other way? I have not been told yet. Wake that rock up. <laughs> One man steps forward, and his name is Dennis. He steps forward and he says, It pains me to say this, my friend, but I cannot waste the lives of my men. Not in this. The bushy-browed man turns to look at Mofir. I wish I had the faith that you do in this man's memory, but I do not. I am sorry. And Strom nods to him, and Dennis turns and walks off. Strom watches Dennis leaving for a moment, seeing his force diminish by hundreds with the man's steps. Then he looks back to those who were placing their trust in him. I understand the concerns that all of you have. His eyes turn to his brother and his companions. These men must reach their destination to save us all. Mofir, you have a premonition. Does that mean he has like a seizure and yeah. 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 shits him? Yeah, yeah, yes. <laughs> <laughs> I'm laying on the ground, quivering. <laughs> Mofir, are you well? I've just spoken to her. Do tell. 
The path to the mindless, its effect on those who walk it, will be suppressed by mother. I, I know I'm new here, but I want to vouch for Mofir. I've been following this man for quite some time, and while he is eccentric, nothing that he's ever told me wasn't true. It's all come to pass. I will also say this to you men who are thinking of leaving the field and going back to your homes and the places that you call home, that eventually the sickness will follow you. It will spread all over the world. The men kind of mutter, and some of them are like, he, he tells the truth, you know, and the rock speaker. I don't know if I trust him. The ape lord controls the mindless. His power is rooted, not of this earth, but of cosmic gulfs beyond human understanding. His influence can be broken, but we must go to the heart of the tower that channels its source. Surely a small party could get there. The host gives us a path. When his power is severed, so shall his hold on the mindless. Mother Earth will protect the minds of Strom Seractus and his host from the corruption of the tower on one condition, that no harm comes to Mofir. It's an escort mission. Kind of self-serving for him, Mofir. For, yeah, this guy's full of crap. Because I love her. <laughs> Mofir's mind is the conduit from which Mother flows. There is a path in the hills that no man has trod. Mother will show it to you. It leads to where the valley is narrow and easily defended, where an enemy of greater number has no advantage. The host of Seractus can amass there. Hold it against the strength of the mindless in the valley, long enough for Mother's champions to get to a gorge that leads to the tower. Okay, so that's when your premonition fades and muttering begins. Someone says, uh, you know, it's We've all... We've got to go. We've got to go. It's all well and good to trust... You know, the man who says that you must protect me from the whole thing. You know, are we going to trust this mummery? Yes, he has this painted savage vouching for him. And Strom Okay, no. And All Strom right. says, And this painted savage's words have my support. I thumb my axe. Uh, one of the captains looks at you, Odred, and, and he says, You truly trust this man and his mind? I haven't followed him this long not to. And then Strom says, Before these men witnessed the Valley of the Mindless and the Sundered Hills, they spoke of a shared vision. Describing those hills and the tower beyond it in perfect detail. Details that only those who have traveled this area could give. I am convinced that what this man says is true, regardless of how fantastic it may seem. So convinced that I'm willing to give my life, if need be, to see him and his comrades do their task. And he just stands there and waits for them. And after a while, they all kind of look at each other and begin to nod. Moonlight shone on the keen knife in the man's calloused hand and glinted in his wide eyes. Two rascals crowded behind him, eager to enter the room, but he stayed them with a hiss from his clenched teeth. Standing in their path was a white, gold-haired woman. Her supple form silhouetted through her sheer shift. Naked feet stood widely braced. The vicious bearded axe in hands held high, poised to strike should he or his companions make further progress into the room. Two forms were behind the she -brew. One was languidly lounging on one of the padded racks, delicious alabaster flesh aglow in the gloom. The other was a tousle-headed child, standing well behind the barbarous woman. The veneer of her innocence broken by the sharp-pointed shiv in her tiny hand, and the murderous look gleaming in her dark eyes. Open up the door. Door's locked from the outside. That ain't cool. But they can see me through the mesh, right? If you have the shade up, then yes, they can see you. Hey! <laughs> when they turn around and look at me, I'm going to do confusion. How many can you affect? I can do three. The one's at the girl's door. Five. And the smarts at a minus two. They can't be too smart because they saw how big Loveisa was. You affect two of them. A sound caught his attention. The men in the adjacent cabin were awake. His companion, Fava, had testified as much with his incessant whimpering. Luckily, he had the foresight to bar the door to the other passenger cabin to prevent any unpleasant interruptions. He spared a glance in the direction of the other cabin. His breath caught in his throat. Demon-eyed eyes bore into his, causing the skin on his back to crawl and sweat to beat on his brow. A groan from Aww. beside him and the feculent smell told him that at least one of his companions beheld the eerie sight as well. So they're shaken. 
Mm-hmm. So they will have to roll to see if they can come out of their, their shaking. So you say, hey, and they, you, they, three of them, they look at you. Uh, the two with uh, weapons look at you, and they go, what in the? You know, they, they're, they're startled. The guy in the back was already shaken. <laughs> so, and that was from uh, the intimidation. So I just muscle muscle Duran out of the way and <laughs> Hey <laughs> You're gonna have to break that door down, dude. There's still the one that's nearest me. There's three of them in the doorway. Okay. All three of them are shaken. Okay. Commence with the murder. Two sevens. Those are two hits. Roll your damage uh, separately for each. Seven. Seven. And twelve. The bearded ruffian turns to see the brutal axe sweep past him in a murderous flash, caving in his comrade's head with a sickening crunch. He blinks, attempting to clear his vision from the gore that splattered him. He sluggishly raises his long knife in a defensive gesture, feebly attempting to keep his death at bay, but his aim was off, and his eyes dilated as he watched the head of the axe sink into his chest. As he sinks to the floor, watching his life bubble out of him in ebbing crimson waves, he hears the clamor of the outer chamber filled with his hairy-faced crewmates, descending the stairs from the deck and howling with lust for blood. His dimming eyes turn to the last of the men who ventured with him into the den of the she-tiger, Fava, the youngest of the crew, stood before the barbarian, unarmed. The youth grabs at the axe in the wild woman's hands, a vain effort to stave off his demise. So that is a, an attack against your fighting skill. Okay. <laughs> Three. Two. Does that count as a failed attack? Do I get a counterattack? Yes. Five. Five is a miss. Fava bounds back, nearly avoiding the bloodthirsty weapon of the snarling woman. Somebody help me! A malicious chuckle sounds from outside the doorway, and the ship's brawny-armed bosun steps into the glow of the moonlight, a thick belaying pin in his meaty hands. I'll show you how to tame this wild one, boy. Come, girl, give us a kiss. His scarred lips pucker over broken teeth. The outer chamber teems with shaggy men, brandishing knives and clubs, as a reedy seaman leans his back and shoulders against the neighboring door, attempting to ensure that the men stay in there. Ronios. I'm going out the window. Okay, you're going out the portal. Yeah. That's a agility check, so your agility and a D6 at a minus two. <laughs> One. Springing to the inner side of the hull, Ronios begins to wedge himself through the narrow portal. Moments of contortion are met with such resistance that he quickly realizes that he is held fast and that his head and shoulders are outside the ship, while his dangling legs are kicking on the inside. Just like Vinnie the Pooh. Renyard, what do you do? So is there a guy leaning against the door? Yeah, um... He's, uh, he's watching his mates file into the chamber, and uh, they're headed towards the girls' room. Can I stab him through the mesh of the door? Um, he'll get a parry bonus and a toughness bonus, but yeah, you can. How much? It's not that much. It's a lattice screen, so... No, it doesn't matter. I'll do it anyway. Go ahead and make your fighting attack. Five and eleven. Five and eleven. Go ahead and roll your damage. Twelve. All eyes turn as a scream from the man placing the door catches the room's attention. Fat sanguine drops dapple the wooden floor as the wiry man spins in a circle, stamping his feet in agony. The source of his distress is quite obvious. Two feet of steel stands from the wooden mesh of the cabin door, glistening wetly. At the threshold of the closed door, a severed ear lies in a pool of crimson. Ronios, agility check to get out of the portal. Son of a... One. (laughs) Many? Yeah. Rain pelts the face of Ronios as he squirms, attempting to free himself from the predicament he was in. He realized that his plan of slipping through the portal and making his way behind the sadistic seaman was folly. Unfortunately, this realization came too late. At this point, I think I'm just going backwards out the <laughs> hole. I'm not going through. I'm, I, I can't get out. So I'm just trying to get out. Yeah. Uh, so four. Four. His drenched upper body aiding his purpose, he slithers back into the cabin and sinks onto Renyard's rack with an exasperated sigh. Renyard eyes him for a moment, noting the growing darkening spot on his bed. Well, that was a total waste of time. <laughs> Damn it. Shame you couldn't have just thrown yourself into the sea. Rid us of your incompetence. Shut up! Perhaps you could stay focused for once and join the fight once I get this door open. Oh shit, I could do that. I'm going to cast my other spell, Havoc, my new one. Okay. I'm going to put four points into it. Eleven. Eleven. So you get a raise? Uh, make a strength roll or be knocked 2d6 inches in a random direction. And just all the people under the... Uh, medium medium. Burst. Dust begins swirling at the center of the outer chamber, causing the stained linen tablecloth to flap. 
The whirlwind grows in intensity until two of the gaping seamen are cast headlong into the far bulkhead, their groans mixing with the howls of pain from the man who Renyard maimed as the tempest dies away as quickly as it began. I'm going to stay at the entryway okay. of our room to okay. guard the girls, and I'm going to attack the nearest dudes. A nine and a three. Nine is a hit. Twenty. Lovaisa glares at the man standing before her. Though unarmed, he was not to be spared. He and his cronies had betrayed her trust. Her companions had paid for their service, shared their food, and slept under their protection. This level of treachery spurred her to a murderous frenzy. The fear in the man's eyes turned to horror as she chops through his shoulder and breast with a powerful two-handed blow. She watches with seething ardor as his eyes snap open in a final jolt of pain as she wrenches her axe from his cooling corpse. She deftly sidesteps as the glowering bosun swings at her with his belaying pin, while another shaggy reprobate steps over the bloody carcass and into the doorway. A swipe of her weapon keeping the bosun at bay. In the outer chamber, the gathered scoundrels back away from the bolted cabin door as the blade piercing it is withdrawn. Renyard, I'll attack the door. Damage enough to get through. Uh, okay, that's a fighting roll. Five. Okay, you're attacking a door, so uh, you hit. Damage? Sixteen. Slivers of wood explode into the chamber as the blade of Renyard obliterates the cabin door. Bust out into the hallway with my scimitar. The two guys that I knocked down, are they still on the ground? At this point, yes. Then I will... So they are already shaking. Then okay. I will do a wild attack. Eleven? Yeah. Is a hit. And a raise. Yeah. A hit. 24 damage. Through the breach, Valak adroitly springs into the room, scimitar flashing in the darkness. A wet gurgle sounds as one of his staggered foes, reeling from the effects of being dashed, is slashed across the throat. It's on now! In the cramped cabin, the snarling bosun and his partner move towards Lovaisa, probing for an opening, finding none. At one point, the brawny officer had to pull his counterpart back, lest he be lured into a faint and brained for his effort. Two sea dogs rush to the other chamber, seeing the nearly naked swordsman in the shattered door, trusting in the thrusts of their long knives and hoping that the man's limited maneuverability in the narrow doorway would hinder him. Quick, savvy parries met their feeble thrusts, and a sly riposte nearly skewered one of them. Seeing one of the passengers barrel into the outer chamber and dispatch one of their friends, girded a cluster of sailors into action who surround Valak. Their exuberance proved blunder as they stumbled over each other in a vain effort to avenge their shipmate, leaving the queer-eyed man unscathed. Vaisa! Two of them in the door. All right, so I'm doing my two attacks. Okay. I got a nine and a two. Okay, go roll your damage. Ooh, tens explode. That is 18, son. The beefy bosun's jaw opened in shock at the speed in which the blonde barbarian wielded the heavy bearded axe. His death cry muffled by the weapon's blade as it tore into his mouth, hewing flesh, teeth, and spine. Oranios, what are you doing? Okay, I'm going to try and reach past him to the uh, uh, closest guy and stab him. All right, so you're, re- all right, so you're using, using uh, Rinyard as cover, and you're just coming around and stabbing a guy. Yeah. Okay. Seven. So Five. That's a fine edge of the Zamorian's blade glimmers in the moonlit room as he cuts at the sailor before Rinyard. The overextension of his thrust fouls his aim. All he manages to succeed in is rending the man's silken shirt. Oranios, a tailor of Zamora. Shut up! (laughs) (laughs) He moved! It's not my fault! Rignard. I will cut more than your shirt. It's an ugly shirt anyway. Sweep the two guys in front of me. Nine. So you hit both of them on your sweep. So roll your damage. Sixteen and seven. Shining steel slices through the throat of a dog that steps too close to Rignard, and its point fleshes the curb beside him in the groin. The living sailor drops his knife and sinks to his knees, holding his wound, while his comrade bleeds out, eyes and mouth agape. And now your signature weapon attack. Seven. Seven's a hit. Eight. Shaken by his grievous wound, the dull-eyed seaman watches as Renyard draws the blade from his gushing England and buries it to the cross guard in his chest. Can I move? Uh, yeah. Uh, up, to your, up to your pace is a free action, so yes. I will move to the center of the outer room. Okay. Wait, where's the guard? He's still standing outside the captain's door. He's not fighting? No. Hmm. Okay, I'll go to the center, where most of the guys are. The hairs at the nape of her neck prickle as if touched by unseen fingers, as a muffled, guttural sound catches Lovaisa's ears. She instinctively turns toward it, and looks at the sentinel before the captain's cabin. His head was turned to the side, evidence that he heard it too. How many are around me? Four. Sweep. Five. Benny? I'm betting it. Ten. Ten is a hit. So you hit four of them. 
Any idea how much blood is going to be in this hallway? <laughs> 17 damage. Good God. Dang, man. Renyard moves among the sailors before they can react. His sword singing death. Powerful arm, shoulder, and back propels steel through flesh, bone, and viscera. House of the newly dying weave with those of the wretches writhing on the crimson floor. <laughs> I move to another target and use my signature weapon attack. 19. 19 is a raise, so you get an additional d6 damage. Bad motherfucker. 13 damage. Stepping over a screaming foe, Rinyard backs one of the remaining against the wall. The fool drops his knife in the face of certain death, expecting quarter. The Platonian gives him none, shoving the steel into him until the point stood two feet from the cat's back. One guy left? Uh, yeah, in the room, yes. I'm going to do my uh, patented wild attack cold shot head. That's not counting the guard standing out front of the captain's quarters. Nine to hit. Nine to hit, that's factoring in all your minuses? Is a hit. Twelve damage. Still reeling from being dashed against the wall by an unseen force, the remaining deckhand groggily looks up at the weird-eyed man as his scimitar races and falls, splitting his skull. An inhuman roar of rage blasts from the stairwell as a second wave of bearded degenerates pour into the chamber, their eyes red with murder, blind to the carnage at their feet and intent on slaughter. Having finished his prey, Valak turns to face the onrushing mob. So the four on Valak. That's two hits right there. A nine, is that a raise? Yeah. So one guy hits, another guy gets a raise. Ten damage. Toughness? I have a six and then a one in parentheses. So six. So six. One's from armor. The other one, damage? Eight. So now I want to spend my betting, and then I roll. It's your uh, vigor and a d6. Six free rolls. Nine. You soak both wounds. Good job. There you go. That's a well-spent Benny. Four on Rignard. A five. Four misses, so you have a counterattack. Eight. Eight is a hit. Uh, Twelve damage. One bold rascal moves in to skewer Rinyard with his shiv, only to find his weapon arm hewn at the shoulder. His screams indistinct amid the rest. One on Ronios! Four. What's your parry? Six. One on Lovaisa. He rolls a one, so he comes in and stumbles on one of the dead bodies and falls at your feet. <laughs> I'm going to use my counterattack. That's fine. So he stumbles at your feet and you just kind of <laughs> crank him one. Okay. Yeah. That's a nine. Nine's a hit. And that's an eleven. The Azier snarls as the hapless Cretan falls face first onto the hard wooden floor. <clears throat> Without hesitation, she brings the heavy blade of her axe down, emptying his skull. More killing! Five? Five is a miss. She grins at the lone man in the doorway, shaking his head in an attempt to clear his gore-spattered eyes. Fortune smiles on him as the remnants of her butchery foul her grip and she misses her target, nearly losing her weapon in the process. Ronios. Okay, I am uh, going to uh, just stab at him. You watch out! That's the tailor of Zamora! Ten. Uh, ten is a hit. Okay. Roll your damage. Fifteen. Ronios evades the clumsy swipe from the untrained seaman. Before the man can recover, the Zamorian's keen blade flashes, and his opponent drops, spurting blood from a severed, gurgling windpipe. That's what we call a Zamoran necktie. I'm going to intimidate so that I get to use former gladiator, and okay. I get to do two attacks. <laughs> right. That is a five. He is not intimidated by you. Eight. Eight is a hit. Damage. Twelve? Adjusting her grip on the haft, Lovaisa's wide-braced legs shift as she brings the dripping weapon to bear and plunges it into her enemy with such blinding speed that all he can do is blink as his head wheels from his neck in a jet of crimson. Renya, three guys around you. Sweep. Benny. Eleven. Eleven hits. Roll your damage. Thirteen damage. Three more dogs are put down by Renyard's blade clearing a path for him to step behind those surrounding Valak. Eight. Eight hits. Eight damage. Crunch of bone sounds as Renyard's sword chops into the side of an unlucky sailor's head. Though he is not immediately killed by the blow, he is sent reeling to the floor to toil amid his slain comrades. Despite the slayer poised behind them, the remaining ruffians focus on Valak. Thank you. Ooh, a nine. That's a hit and a raise. Hit and a raise. Damage. Seven. Toughness? Six. So you are shaken. 
Roll my toughness plus a d6. No, you spend a Benny, you automatic. You don't have to spend a Benny to... I'm not soaking. I'm just Benny out of the shake. Right. And then you can act on your turn. It's my turn. Going berserk. Use the rapid attack to attack each one of those guys. Three. Nine will be on another guy. And then this ten, I got to reroll. Thirteen. One straight up hit, one raise. Eight damage. Uh, He's now shaking. Second guy. Two of them are shaking now. Now this is an additional d6 damage. Seven damage. And he's shaking. So three shaking guys. Someone needs to come mop up these guys. Run you. Come, come kill these guys because I'm at a minus four. Okay. Um, all right. I will throw my dagger at him from across the room. Eight. Eight is a hit. Roll your damage. Two. Two. So it bounces off of him. Three screwed up dudes next to you. Right. So same thing again. All right. Six. Uh, six is a miss. Seven. Seven is a hit. Ten. Ten is a hit. Thirteen damage. Fifteen damage. Clenching his teeth in rage, Valak's arching blade eviscerates one wretch, then spins and clefts another's skull with his etched scimitar. One shaken guy is no longer shaken and can act this round. (laughs) Right, and now I'm standing here with the a three parry. And Danny swipes at you. With a three. (laughs) (laughs) That's beautiful. My toughness is now eight, so that's all right. Jeez. Fuck you, man. (laughs) Twelve so far on that one. Yeah, and a five, so that's 17. 17. 20. 20 damage. So you go, boom, boom, kill his two friends, and he kind of snaps out of it and just... He stabs me in the fucking neck. (laughs) All righty, so that's... that's right. uh, now, now I can switch to the Damus Carnvoy's for all the damage <laughs> my trachea. What's your, uh, what's your toughness? Eight at the moment. Eight, so that is 20 would be three raises. Yeah. That means that... You're dead. That's three wounds you're going to have to try and soak. Benny, spent. Six. So he sticks you in the neck and you start to spurt blood over his hand. I might have... Big mistake. Well, I was trying to ask earlier. I'm just going to leave him to deal with that. I have a dagger in my throat. Shouldn't you be screaming? It's really quite painful. I would scream, but it hurts. From what I heard in the captain's cabin, yes. would that be... Like, it, was it, it suspicious it, enough? Oh, it's definitely suspicious, and it's continuing. It's just keeps getting progressively louder. Now that there's not as many people in the room being, well butchered, then now you hear it more distinctly as this rumbling grumble, and then you hear a scream come from the quarters. Rainyard, protect the girls. The guard at the door turns and opens up the door. Can the, I see in there? The, yeah, opens up the door and grabs his eyes and falls to his knees. I think the term is we is screwed. Okay, Loisa, what do you do? Uh, <laughs> I'm running for the dinghy. Alright, I'm gonna attack the guy attacking Mark. Five. Five is a miss. Run your save me. Hello. I'm going to walk up and shank him. Okay. Nine. Hits. So, 15. Engrossed in watching Valak writhe in pain, the thug fails to notice Ronios approach him from behind. His eyes widen and lull when the point of the Zamorian's knife is thrust into the base of his skull. The lithe thief lovingly eases the man to the floor as he smiles at the prostrate form of Valak. Thank you. You're welcome. Please pull this knife out of my throat. Oh, for God's sake, man. Why would you leave that in? <laughs> I'm bleeding. Okay, here. I, I take off my sash and I wrap it around his neck. <laughs> Please turn it on my head. <laughs> yes. The grumble of voices sound from the stairwell. Standing foremost is the stoop back cook, Nick Cleaver, in his hand. His round eyes take in the scene and he hesitates, those behind him gasping at the sight of the dead. Everybody goes to the captain's door. So you're going You're going to the captain's door or anybody yeah. else? I definitely go to the captain's door. I'm kind of staying back a little so that if anyone comes through the other doors, okay. like you towards see the, the girl. You see the hairy-faced sailors still in the doorway, and they're sneering as they observe the carnage in that room. Because how many guys are dead in that room? 20? 20. 23. 23 guys are de- laying there dead in that room. And they didn't rush in, but you know, like they're wanting to, but the sight of all their dead friends are kind of holding them back. Is there somewhere that I can be in between where Lalika and Nadia are and if anyone tries to, like, charge them but also kind of see into the captain's 
room yes. better. You can kind of stand in their way, the guy's way, yeah. from coming down the stairs, and then you can look to the side and see what's in the room, yes. I'm going to grab a fistful of entrails, and I'm going to wrap it around the head of a corpse like he's still alive, okay. and pretend to strangle the guy in full view of the seven guys that are still upstairs so they won't come down. <laughs> the bloody woman stand there with an axe, and you're choking a guy with his own guts. <laughs> so Ronios and Renyard go to the door. Dark silk curtains billow in the night wind like silent specters as Ronios and Renyard enter the captain's cabin. The source of the gale becomes quickly apparent. Abaft windows stood open to the night. The lingering aura of freshly extinguished candles mixes with the pungent smell of slaughter. Simok lounges in the dark on a thick cushioned bench near the back windows, arms wide and head back. His eyes are open, staring blankly into the moonlight. Ronios approaches him cautiously. As his face gets within a hand's breadth of the large man's, the Zamorian turns suddenly to the window. A shuffle and click of clawed feet on wood caught his attention. Ronios's eyes dilate in terror. His mouth silently works as a look of understanding crosses his face. Then a soul-rending scream erupts from his mouth. <coughs> Renyard steps tentatively, following the Zamorian, his sword raised. The toe of his boot found the thief. Turning him slightly, he could hear his raspy breathing. The Poitanian squints at the form of the captain and notes with disgust the flayed ribs of the man's open chest glistening in the moonlight. A sound behind him freezes his blood and he spins to see red eyes glowing in the gloom. A nightmare shape squatted in the open window. Its malformed head turned as if considering something. Then the beast moved fully into the luminance. It was grotesque, resembling a misshapen baboon, though it had leathery black wings sprouted from its back, which it spread as Renyard stared in disbelief. Wrapped in shadow, he could barely make out scraps of clothing clinging to its shaggy body. A cocksure grin appeared on Renyard's lips. As terrifying as this fiend was, Renyard chuckled at it. You would be much more intimidating if you didn't wear the short pants of a cabin boy. The creature snarls at the jibe as Renyard points his wet blade at it. What do you want here, devil? Simak paid the price for his betrayal. So he did. Proceed on your course, and my master will feast on your heart as I did this traitor. Tell your master. Tell Aura we come for him. You know nothing, fool. With a heave of its bowed legs, the beast leaps into the night, spreading black leathery wings. Flapping fades into the sound of wind and sea. I get my bag of gold off the chest, then I go back to the window and look out. Just look up into the nighted sky. There's The moon is reflecting off the ocean, and you see nothing. Uh, I walk out to the stairs and up to the last seven men. Is that right? Yeah. There's only seven I guys left. On, on the back of the yeah, we head. killed 23. A score of your brethren sleep in hell this night. Serve us or join them. Dawn had not touched the valley floor, though the upper reaches of the high cliffs glowed brightly. Horses snorted in fearful anticipation, though Straub knew that without the effect of Mother Earth, the mounts surely would have fled screaming before this point. Few mindless stragglers had been encountered along the way, but they posed little threat to the scouts that ranged ahead of the host. The hill path that Mofir's goddess guided them through proved ideal for the light cavalry of the assembled Kozak force. It afforded them cover from detection long enough that they were able to muster for a charge into the valley without being harried. He looked to his brother, Odrin, uncomfortably sitting his mare. Concern crossed his face. The younger man's battle prowess he did not question. He had witnessed it firsthand. What concerned him was his fragile emotional state. Odrin suffered from a condition that caused him to fly into brutish fury when in battle. This red rage was a boon and a bane in one. In this case, where Odor will be escorting his friend Mofir through a mass of enemies, it may prove disaster. Strom donned his tall fur hat, blood-red gemstone badge, set in the front, scintillating in the growing light. The mindless are going to get ten tokens. The Kozaks get nine tokens. The mindless outnumber them quite significantly, but are untrained and mindless. And so unarmed. And, well, yeah, untrained, unarmed, and mindless. PC involvement. Should we not fight? Yeah. I'd rather not. I mean, if the purpose of us is to get to the tower, we probably shouldn't participate in the fight at all. Well, you can still participate and still make it to your objective. 
what you're doing is adding to their role. Sean being involved would waste his power points. Yeah, that's not going to happen. Okay. Fighting check. The fuck out of here. Got a four. So you got a success. Okay. The hero fights well and adds plus one to his side's battle roll, though you suffer 3d6 damage. What? So you're giving a plus one. Dan, are you involved? Yes, sir. Okay, make your shooting check. Explodes. Explodes. 28. Your effort adds a plus two to the battle roll, and you emerge unscathed. So, Sean, because you're not actively fighting, I'll let you roll for the Cossacks. Nice. You roll, for, you roll the battle roll. The four explodes. Five. And the target number is five. Ten explodes. Ten explodes. <laughs> 24. 24. Casualties. So four, 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 raises. four raises. They lose four chips. Wow. <laughs> Rumble of hooves on the hard earth echo as a thousand horsemen descend into the narrow region of the valley with the gathering momentum of an avalanche. They smash into the clustered mindless horde with the concussive force of the thunderclap, tearing flesh and crunching bone. The tight wedge formation thrusts into the heart of the mindless, sending them scattered. But these were no natural foe, who would have been instantly demoralized by the sudden strike and utter decimation of their numbers by an opponent with superior tactics and kit. The slavering foe persisted the fight, despite the disadvantage. Intent on the slaughter ahead of him, Strom rides at the van of the host. Arrows from the Hyrcanian Matadon zipping within inches of him, downing foes nearly as fast as the Kozak headman was doing with his sword. They ride for the point of the valley, where the high walls narrowed into a tight net where Mofir's goddess assured them the greatest chance of victory. All right, so Jason, this is the amount of damage you take in the first round of combat. In the oh. first round, there's three. Oh. Oh. 16 damage. 16 damage. What's your toughness? Nine. There you go. All right, so Benny spent. Make your toughness check. That is a six and a five. So you're good. The charge of the Kozaks stalls, not because of the enemy, but due to the fact that they had reached the point of the valley where they could hold the horde at bay. Strom bounds off his horse, continuing his merciless hacking at the grasping hands and gnashing teeth of the mindless. To his rear, his comrades began forming up into tightly packed lines with ranks behind them. He looked to either side, noting the skill at which the steppe barbarians took to the tactics of his homeland. Kozaks fighting afoot with spears, swords, and shields in the fashion of the Gundaman. The thought brought a smile to his face, fortifying his efforts and his humor to the point that he broke into a gusty laugh. <laughs> Round two characters involving in the, themselves in a fight. Yes. Yes. Go ahead and make a roll. What'd you roll? A one and a three. All right, you going to Benny for a re-roll? No. Yes. You only you got go. three. So I don't you, care. You Save it for the soak. <laughs> Save it for the soak. Hot print. Oh, oh double Two ones. ones. Oh, that's really bad. I think I might be dead. <laughs> um, make your shooting check. Releasing some arrows. Ten. Yep. Target number is four, so you get one raise. One raise. Uh, you wreak havoc, slaying enemy leaders and destroying important assets. But you suffer 2d6 damage. Okay. But you add plus two to your side's battle roll. So, Sean, it's the d10, but you're at a plus. You're at a plus six. Plus six. Here we go. Eight. They roll one. Good job. Woo. Two raises. Two, two raises. raises. That's two chips. 2d6 on Dan. Six damage. What's your toughness? My toughness is six. Okay, so that is, that you would be shaken. Okay, so you, you can't can, even soak. You can't soak a shake. Well, the, in a mass you, battle, in a mass battle, shaken is we're disregarding shaken. right because so you wouldn't nothing. spend a Benny for a shaken. Right, this is uh, Jason. You suffer four d six damage. Eighteen. Oh, oh. Hey, you just did that once. I know, but still. It's fine. So your toughness is nine, right? Yes. Two raises. That's two wounds. Two wounds. So you make, got three. Spend a Benny. You got I, three. I've already spent a Benny this round. You can spend a, you can spend as many Bennies as yeah, you want. Okay, right? I got no Bennies left. So you are at. You spent your last Benny. This will be your last Benny. And that was a two and a three. Two wounds, Jason. Lances of white hot pain stabbed at him. Through red haze, Odred noted that somehow he was on the ground. His eyes cleared and his mouth clenched in irritation. Three red-eyed brutes knelt over him, holding him down and sinking broken, yellow teeth into him. He felt the stitched flesh of his previously wounded shoulder shred as jagged nails dug into it and pulled. He screamed in pain and frustration. Then, as darkness started to gather at the corner of his vision, his attackers fell away. In an instant, the pick scrambled to get up, gathering his dropped hatchets in the process and spinning to face any foes who sought to take further advantage of him. 
He turned to see Mophir, who sat his horse several paces away, with a wide lunatic's grin on his grimy face. The mystic clapped in joy, seeing his companion putting on such an enjoyable play. Odoret turned his attention to his fallen attackers, noting the falcon-fletched arrows feathered in each one. He caught the eye of Matadai, riding amid the remaining mindless, loosing death from his strumming Hercanian bow. The Tyranian gave a slight nod as Odoret raised one of his axes in salute to his friend. Okay, third round of, uh, third round of, are you involving yourself in combat there, Hell Odoret? yes. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Hey, bah, bah, bah. hey, if this is where Odoret dies, this is where he dies. He dies this defending This is where he's meant friend. to die. He's meant to die on the By floor, the valley rules? floor. Here he goes. All right, roll it Even up. Even though we'd really ra- like to have you for the boss fight, I'm just saying, <laughs> if this is where you die, this is where you die. Eight. You add two to your team's battle roll, but suffer 2d6 damage. Oh, raining death. It's a 12. Two raises. You're unscathed. And you add two, so that's four. What's the, I, I like the flavor text. What's, what's two raises? Oh, two raises. You cover yourself in glory. Ah, Too bad glory is the name of the guy leading oh, the army. Oh, Destiny. cover yourself in glory. <laughs> okay, so, Sean, uh, you're rolling for the uh, Cossacks, and you are now at, uh, it's, so it's a D10, plus eight. Thirteen. They roll a one. So that's three raises. Three, three raises. raises. That's three chips. Oh. One chip left. Waves of mindless crash against the line of the Kozaks, but due to restrictions of the landscape, they were unable to bear their full numbers against the smaller force. Blood ran ankle-deep in the cracked earth at their feet, but the line held. Uh, but One. we got some damage. Shut up, Dan. Oh, oh, oh. God damn it. One. Five. It's What's your toughness? Eight. Nice. Nine. 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 No, nothing. It doesn't even penetrate his oh, toughness. That's good. Filthy hands grasp it over there, but he keeps them back with the deathly candle sang by his bead adorned tomahawks. Right. Participating. Uh, last round. You're just taking it all to him. Participating. Go ahead and roll your uh, participation. Do it. Do it. Do it. Do it. Eight. Eight. So one raise. Uh, Twelve. So 12. That's two raises again. Glory. Glory hound. Glory. All right, Sean, you're Start plus eight again. Twelve. Twelve. They roll one. Two D six damage on Odred. As we break away, they th- like throw in. No. Oh, snap. Ten. Ten pl- and six explodes. Twelve damage. Toughness is nine, so nine. No, not even a raise. No, it's just nine. one. Hands grasp Odred and he spins. Matadai, gore splattering his bearded face, pulls at him. The pick notices grimly that his friend is without the mount that he last saw him with, no doubt lost during the fray. In the bonded's other hand is Mofir, who stands with glazed eyes, looking at the slaughter with morbid fascination. The three dash for the eastern canyon wall, to the mouth of a gorge well hidden by the contour of the stone. At the aperture, Odrin hesitates. He turns and watches the form of his brother, butchering mindless as he holds the line, protecting him, as he always had. Hand tugs his shoulder and he turns to face the Terranian, who looks at Odrin in the eyes. They have made it this far. It was time to. Glinting metal at the far end of the valley catches his eye. His breath catches in his throat as he watches thousands of Golden Helm Terranians file into the valley. They had none of their trademark organization. They shambled in chaotic urgency toward the line of the Kozaks. They were mindless. The increased numbers, with the added protection of the finely crafted Terranian armor, would make the stand that Strom was making even more perilous. They had to hurry. Lest the Kozaks and Strom died, buying time for them to get to the tower. Odred, Mofir, and Matadai rush up the sand-covered incline, sheer walls towering above them for hundreds of feet. that you've enjoyed this episode of Tower of the Ape. 
please check for further episodes on our website, gamerstable.com. Any use of this production for commercial purposes is prohibited. Written credit for music and other properties used in this production can be found on this episode's dedicated webpage. Conan is the property of Conan Properties International, who have graciously allowed us to make this production. Savage Worlds Deluxe is the property of Pinnacle Entertainment Group. Openly Gamer Theater and Gamer's Table are trademark properties of Side Tangent Productions. <laughs> <laughs>